Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so before I kind of go into my talk, I'd like to say a little bit about what I do at, Ex or what most of us do at Accenture Technology Labs. So one of our jobs is to kind of um, go and research into new technology, new algorithms, um, any other uh, latest stuff that's happening on one side, but on the other side also to look for gaps uh, in the client space where people are looking for like a new solution and they don't have the solution directly from their regular, um, either regular data scientists or their regular staff in general. And a lot of the times, the clients we work with typically will have a data science team who are setting up their A-B testing, who are um, doing other, other things, and they still have like some things that they want to do, and they don't have the bandwidth to actually do it. Um, so my slides and my day-to-day -day work is kind of pulled on two ends. On the uh, one end, I am really trying to make my business savvy clients understand what's going on in the data science world uh, or, how, or how the solution that we are creating is actually making a difference in their company. And on the other hand, I'm working with technology that's like hot out of somewhere. It's breaking most of the time, but it's also giving me something that I want. And there's a good reason why I did, did this like huge introduction and you'll realize it as the talk moves forward. Uh, so the specific thing, I have been working in natural language processing for the past uh, one year and, uh, and pretty much I've worked in like four different projects and in all the projects I, I kind of needed to do some kind of text extraction. Initially I would, and also in all of the projects, like it would be with some kind of data. Typically data does not come with training data or annotated data. So that's also another like huge issue which I face regularly. I feel like a lot of businesses probably face that data don't come with training data and annotating data is expensive. It requires expert knowledge. So people always try to get around like what can we do so that we have to do minimum annotation or combine a human annotation with some more, um, some more logic. Uh, so initially when I was extracting data and I did not have um, training data, I would try to do something hacky, use topic modeling to get some kind of labeling, like take, take all, like do unsupervised learning, take all everything in one cluster and label it as something, and then use that as a labeling set. And it typically does not work that well. And that's one of the reasons I tried to go in the classical direction of data extraction. Um, the other thing is that, like doing, doing a range of unsupervised things also makes you kind of miss a lot of what you want. So a, a lot of the times you have an idea of what you want. Like if you want, uh, if you want CEOs who are, you know, who have received ser Series A funding, uh, it's very hard to do topic modeling and kind of get label data for that thing out of your, um, out of let's say, um, crunch-based data that you have gathered. Uh, so hence the reason for going in a very um, circuitous route or a traditional route, however you want to put it, uh, towards data extraction. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of business process actually requires reading, like mortgage applications, you kind of need to look at the backgrounds of the people applying for the loan, you need to extract specific things, specific numbers, credit scores, uh, there are different kinds of legal contracts, there are um, other things uh, in, in the academic space, there are people who really need to read papers to kind of extract specific information out of it. And typically in most of these cases, actually I was recently talking to somebody in DNA sequencing and they were actually saying that they had to take the sequence and then search through papers and find the paper that actually talks about how that sequence, if it's altered, will cure the disease. And the process of actually having to read through all those papers to get that is a lot of really expert work. And some of the things that I'm going to talk about, the idea is to reduce that reading or even remove it to a certain, depending on the problem that you're doing. So the first typical approach to any text is, I'm probably not supposed to turn, um, is you need to tokenize a, te a text, you, can, uh, you need to normalize, do word sense disambiguation, do parsing, part of speech, and if this is like regular text that's written in papers, or if 
you know, it's, if it's normal English, most of the time a parser like the Stanford NLP parser that I use will do all of this for you. The amount of data that I've seen or the variety of data that I've seen, there are types of data that actually don't follow the language or the grammar. For instance, people will write a different language but use, still use English uh, characters. So it's very hard to kind of um, use like a parser to understand what's going on. At that time, you might have to like write your own code, custom code to do that. Another place where I have seen the parser to completely fail is machine-generated data. And if you get machine-generated text data, and if you can actually trace the source that, was, that generated that data, it would be quite easy to parse it because it's kind of robotic and repetitive. Again, most of the time I actually don't get the source, so at that point I have to write my own parsers. Or if I want to extract things like port numbers, emails, it's again hard to go through the regular language parser. Uh, but yeah, with regular text, I think any parser in LTK or Stanford NLP will do it. And uh, the typical, um, typical approach that I take is the first I, uh, and this is also very standard, first I try to find by ad hoc means like relevant sentences. So let's say if I was scraping this data from the web, I would probably find certain sections of the HTML that's interesting. If it were papers, certain sections might contain what I want. And extracting relevant sentences kind of makes like the job computationally much uh, easier because the less text you pass through your pipeline, uh, the better it is. Um, the, then kind of find uh, find, I call them candidates, but find the phrases that, or unigrams or bigrams or trigrams that would represent what you're trying to find. In some cases, for instance, the example that I'll go through here in, in case of diseases, uh, I've seen nouns and different combination around nouns are a good candidate. Sometimes other combinations of uh, post, um, the part of speech tags could also be good candidates. And the next step would be extract features. And uh, this could be bag of words around nouns. Uh, it could also be word to vec feature vectors for the phrases that you're looking at. Um, and once you have that, and you have some training data that you can map and balance, uh, you, can, you can feed that to a machine learning algorithm such as logistic regression and get what you want. So for instance, if in, in the problem that I'll show, I'm looking for disease name, names. And uh, I expect my classifier to tell me, yes, this is a disease name. No, that's not a disease name. It's all well and good, but map training data. That's the part that's really hard. I mean, where do you get the training data? And I mean, how do you, how do you generate it? In the, specifically in the medical space, I've seen people, there are companies which even have MDs in their annotating group who actually tell them what the text is about. And it's very hard, especially at Accenture, where, I mean, we try to solve like four clients, at least start with sol finding a solution that satisfies like four different clients. And people also come to us when they have a lot of data and nobody's looking at the data. So in general, it's very hard to just get annotated training data. So what, what we try to do is we try, uh, we've taken like a different approach and we've taken the route of going into using the domain knowledge and trying to incorporate the domain knowledge in the algorithm and have minimal training data. So this is a project called Snorkel and Deep Dive. And it's come out of Stanford, out of Professor Chris Ray's group. Um, I've put his picture there because he's a really nice guy. And if you feel interested about this, you can go and talk to him. And he's very excited if people want to work uh, with the snorkel and the deep dive technology. And the thing that snorkel promises, uh, in their paper actually, they use 10 training data and they use 100 annotated data. And you could call it like 110 training points as such. And they get uh, kind of like an 80% uh, F1 score, uh, like a 0.8 F1 score. Now the paper is of course, you know, I mean people really know their data at that point. And um, it's done for a specific space. Uh, so my guess is that in reality, you might need like a thousand annotated data for a space that you don't know a lot about. But a thousand is also a very small number for like if you have millions of data points. Um, and the promise and the reason why, I mean, why you don't need the training data, it's not magic. It's basically writing rules. So you uh, eventually you end up writing rules, things you know about your data. 
and I will go into it in more details. And those rules are kind of modeled with parameters in them, and then the code basically returns the weights of the rules and how the rules conflict and which ones should dominate, and that produces a training, a training set for the uh, classifier. So the main, main takeaway from the snorkel environment is that it doesn't need training data, and the reason it doesn't need training data is it needs very good rules. And eventually, and in the process of getting to the rules is actually quite non-trivial if you're starting a new project. What happens is we interview people who are experts in their fields, especially, uh, specifically in the client teams, and we convert their knowledge into rules. And the better your rules are, the better the code will perform. And in some sense, they, it, the work of converting domain knowledge into rules is less work compared to just sitting there annotating, saying yes, no, yes, no, to like thousands of sentences. So here is the snorkel pipeline. Um, so you, again, the first few are kind of similar. You get the text that's relevant. You get the candidates. And then you write the rules. The rules could be something like, you know, I. Um, for instance, for the specific case of medical data, I have things like I want treatment before, um, before the candidate. So those are, t those are typical rules. Or um, I don't want the word disease in the candidate because it's a generic word and I'm looking for specific diseases. And the rules kind of keep getting better as you do it. Like the first time you write the rules, everything is terrible. Your results are also terrible. And then you keep iterating and keep using the UI also to look at the data, which keeps making it better. Another thing that has really helped me in one of the project is that um, just communication with the SME and the person in that project just knew a lot about the data and he could just tell me a list of things that I could convert into rules very soon. Also, if someone gives you like a thousand training data, there are ways to take that training data and convert it into, um, convert it into a set of rules that, um, that can be outputted by your code. So the specific data example that I'm going to go through is an FDA drug label. Uh, the FDA drug label is typically what comes behind your Tylenol bottle. Uh, the answer that I'm looking for is what disease does the drug treat? So this is already a drug label. I don't have to worry about the drug. I just have to pick out the disease. There's a section called indications and usage. And if you just look at, zoom into this, um, zoom into this uh, label, you, you will see most of the information is there. And that's when I, what I mean when I say extract sentences that have relevant information. And then use those sentences to find which diseases the drugs treat. And these are some typical examples. For instance, one of one sentence is, it is indicated for treating respiratory disorder caused due to allergy. One thing I want here is I want respiratory disorder, I don't want allergy. And for the relief of symptoms of depression, I actually want depression here, uh, so my color coding is not right. And then anticonvulsant, um, like this sentence is talking about anticonvulsant. And then there are sentences where sometimes it's very hard to just read it and say what they are talking about. The other data set that I'm interested in is clinical trials data. And this is very interesting because if you want, again, to do a clinical trial, apparently the typical route to go is go into PubMed and basically search for whatever you're trying to search. Uh, and uh, search for the drugs, for the type of trial you're doing, and basically get all the papers and read the papers and figure out what has happened in the past. Whereas this information is typically there in all of PubMed, and you have things like the first sentence, we present a case of a 10-year-old boy uh, who had severe relapsing pancreatitis three times within three weeks after starting the treatment of methylphenidate due to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, so we kind of want to in, uh, infer the age group, the gender, uh, the side effect, what it was treating, how long was the duration. So this is something, and this data, it's very hard to get training data for something like this. Like, you would need so many SME hours to get training data for this, is it's nearly impossible. But what we want is, this is the unstructured text. At the end of it, we want tables that have these information. And these are like the go uh, entity goals that we are looking for. In some cases, we just want the entities. 
In some other cases, we want also relationship between entities. For, for instance, the relationship between pancreatitis and Ritalin is that it is an adverse effect or a side effect. The relationship between ADHD and Ritalin is that it treats Ritalin. So we are also trying to recover the different types of relationships. And at the end of the day, you would have different either files or databases that will get stored um, in, your, in, in your file system. So now I'll go into a little bit more details of the process. So the first process is candidate extraction. And I spoke a little about it. Um, I, in one example, I said like all nouns are probably my candidates. Typically, um, you want a candidate set that does not, that's not too big. So if you take something like all noun phrases, it is too big. And it, is, it pretty much like covers all your data. And it's very hard to work with that big a data set. So you want something which has like 80% recall, 20% precision. So you want a candidate extractor that, that covers every possible thing, but not everything. Um, and so the first line is kind of like the, this is like one example for one of our client cases. And the first line is the, uh, the pause tag that kind of we identified for that specific candidate extractor. And in the second line, and what we have is some more characteristics of what we wanted. And in this case, you see there's a long regex, and I've kind of covered it because it's proprietary. Uh, but this basically has, this regex has like eight expressions um, separated by ors. And what we got at the end of it, and we combined these two and took an intersection of them. But what we got in the, at the end of it was too accurate. So it was like 60% accurate, which meant it was also throwing out a lot. Like we were missing a lot. So you also want something that's very general. So in this specific case, we just removed everything that we had and just put VPN in, in there because VPN was a specific thing we were looking at. So it's very important to be general, but again, just going with things like noun typically is too big to handle. Uh, another question that I always get, so I decided to kind of put this uh, slide in, is that snorkel um, kind of takes the features automatically, so you don't have to worry about features. Typically, the last time I gave this talk, I was not using Snorkel, so I spent like, quite a bit of time talking about Word2Vec features, talking about like, bag of words features and things like that. I don't have any of those slides, but I wanted to show like, the sent a typical sentence structure, and the features are basically things that come out of the parser, like pause tags, context, the dependency trees, the character offsets, what's the position, and um, once you identify the, find the candidate, just the snorkel automatically goes and picks up the features. So you actually don't have to worry about that part at all. Next, I will go into the rule functions. So this is what like a typical set of rule functions look like. And the, the parser typically outputs things like lemmas or words or the dependency tree or the pause tags. And you will learn, the process of learning the rules, like this, these are a set of very, well, they're sort of complete rules. When you start with the rules, you typically have like three positive ones, three negative ones. They don't give good results, but they give you some results and you kind of iterate through that. And uh, typical, like for instance, this is, th these rules are about uh, genes. So if you have the gene in the post window, then it's most likely your answer. Or if you have genotype in dependency parents, then it's your answer. So these are things, these are rules that were specifically written by biologists, and they really knew their domain well. Typ typically, most people don't know their domain that well, and that comes through just looking at the data or just even doing simple things like bag of words on your candidates to see how your candidates are doing. And Eventually, after a few iterations, you can reach a pretty good sp space. The other thing that's really important is to look at how your rules are doing before doing any learning. So uh, basically, the code returns which rules are conflicting the most, uh, which rules are the least uh, accurate. So you can go and change those rules to get better results. Um, typically, if you have good rules, what you expect is that um, you get like a good amount of positive results, a good amount of negative results, and the zero ones are ones that the rules could not decipher. Um, this is like one, uh, one intermediate output of a rule that I put in here 
just to show you that when you start the process, you won't get something this nice. Uh, and you have to basically go through your data to create a good amount of positive and negative rules. And here you see the negative is very small because in this particular data set, I could not think of what characteristics would generate the negative data. Um, and after this process, once you have the rules, once you have the candidates, all you do is you feed it to the learner and uh, the learner tells you, oh, there's one more step I, that I missed and sorry about that, which is before the rules, and I'll kind of go into it when I, ha I have a small demo at the end. Before the rules, there's also a step where you go into a UI and you annotate around 100 labels and uh, the rules kind of use those 100 labels and the learner uses those 100 labels to get to the answer. And this is like an example of, a, of the results derived from the FDA drug labels. Uh, so we're looking at lithium carbonate and these were several of the candidates, bipolar disorder, individual maintenance, manic episode, and snorkel kind of labeled bipolar disorder and manic episode um, as the ones that lithium carbonate treats. So this was one of the goals of the things that we were trying to do. So most of the time, if you, for, like, if you don't spend a lot of time with the data, uh, and if you like, spend, let's say, two, three weeks with snorkel and the data, it's possible to go somewhere between 65 to 70% accuracy. And bear in mind, you don't have any training data. They're just 100 that you labeled, which is pretty good. Now going to 80%, from 70% to 80% requires quite a bit of effort in terms of iterating through the process of rules, uh, through the process of getting better rules or candidates. And these rules, I mean, the way they are modeled inside the code is that uh, they're modeled as a softmax uh, with a bunch of parameters, and then people do GIP sampling on top of it to, uh, to evaluate those parameters. So it's not, it's not magic, it's some regular math. Uh, another thing that I am very fond of is just having like a Docker container for most of the things that I do, primarily because I kind of move. Um, I sometimes work on my machine. I work on our local cluster and on clients clusters. So moving things around is really easy for uh, with a Docker container, and I don't have to worry too much about it. And my setting pretty much gets done in this one file where I have a requirements.txt where I have the Python stuff and then I have the other Ubuntu stuff in the Docker file and that's pretty much it. Now, if I compare like a typical machine learning pipeline with Snorkel, there are a bunch of things I do. Like t typically in machine learning, I use scikit-learn to do all of the stuff. So I'll have like details of, you know, using the pipeline, stitching things together. I talk about you know, how do I balance the training set, I talk about word vectors, and today my talk actually finished much, much quicker, it almost finished much quicker than it normally does, simply because Snorkel takes care of all of this. And the only thing that it asks you for is domain knowledge. It asks you for very good domain knowledge. You have to do some hyperparameter tuning, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Of course, the codes right now are in research slash development mode, so the codes break a lot. But apart from that, you don't need to be, like you don't need to worry about feature, uh, uh, generating features. You don't need to worry a lot about what kind of, um, what kind of machine learning technique do you want to use. Uh, you could if you wanted to, but you actually don't have to. Um, the next thing, yeah, and, um, Finally, I have like the pros and cons of uh, Snorkel and um, yeah. And the main, I mean the pros are pretty, pretty good and the main reason why we use it despite the fact uh, that it is in development mode and it is really hard to use a code that's breaking all the time and then deliver the results to the client um, is that we pretty much never get training data. And we also spend like at most two to three months on a project so that's a very small amount of time to get and annotate data and do something very good. So even when we get a 70% accuracy in the first few weeks, that's a huge bump for us. A lot of times people will see these results and get very impressed and we'll work for them longer. Um, this kind of idea can be used in a range of like uh, problems. 
Uh, bank loans, it's something I spoke about before. Market research reports is another project that I worked on, uh, on similar ideas. And in that project, the, um, there were MBAs hired, MBAs with eight years of experience hired to just read through a lot of documents proprietary and then go to Google and search for some more and create reports. So in that case, they didn't want to stop reading, but we just used this extraction technique to point them to the right paragraphs or to the right documents that they were looking for. So their reading went down from three weeks to one week. So that was something that, uh, that I really enjoyed working on. And finally, uh, if you want the code, uh, you can go to Hazy Research Snorkel. Um, the best way to work with this right now is to collaborate with Professor Chris Ray's team, uh, simply because the code is kind of changing very fast. and um, yeah, and there is not much documentation on top of it. So the only way I know how to do things is either read through the code or ask, pe ask people in the group what's going on. Uh, and this is the paper that kind of talks about what's going on behind the scenes with the rules and uh, what kind of uh, probabilistic graphical models they're using and what statistical inference they're doing to get here. Uh, now that I have some more time, and you can also contact me if you want um, to know more on how to kind of use research and university code in a very demanding setting. Now that I have a little bit more time, I'm going to have a very, very small demo. Um, I'm not going to run this because I'm not sure, this is on the cluster and I'm not sure if I'm connected. It also takes a little bit of time to run. Uh, but the thing that I want to show is for this particular problem, um, I kind of wrote a candidate extractor and to make the data really small, I kind of only look for infections, chronic, and depression kind of words. And then I fed it to the, um, the sentence viewer. And it kind of, you, oh, 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 sorry. Uh, how do I, okay. Yeah, so the first thing that I have is I've loaded parse data, which is basically the output of um, Stanford NLP parser. And then I have written um, candidate extractor, which is basically a combination of nouns and some of the words that I wanted to look at. Again, this is like too specific. For, so for the real problem, I would write something way more general. Um, but this kind of brings down the data set to a huge extent. Mm. And then you have the choice of putting it in a viewer. And the nice thing about the viewer here is that this is like, this process is also very iterative. So you might or might not, not like what you're seeing. So you go back and you change the, uh, change the candidate extractor to see if, you get, if you're getting the type of candidates that you really want. And this is the kind of data that comes up. And yeah, in this case, like we see a lot of good data here, um, just because of the, um, just because I have made it pretty, I have made it pr pr pretty narrow. The other thing that I wanted to show was the UI for, and by the way, most of the things that I'm showing in the demo, like I didn't really make a formal demo because things are changing. Sorry, things are changing so much that. Like whatever I show today will have completely changed next week. Not necessarily conceptually, but just like the UIs or, and not even necessarily the UIs because it takes time to write the UIs, but the way the commands are called or. Uh, yeah, so this is like the uh, UI for annotating data. So you can go in, and this I already annotated as um, as a disease. And this is respiratory tract infection, but since it only has tract infection, I'm going to <coughs> label it as a negative one. And this got the whole one, so I'm going to label it as a positive one. And this talks about urinary tract infections, which is kind of correct. So this is like the UI interface for the human annotation in between. And for most of the client projects, what we do is we send this MindTagger uh, screen 
to the client's uh, SME and explain how to use it, and they'll typically tag it and send it back to us. So that's it from me. Mm, yeah, I'm open to questions. Yeah. After you've uh, written all the rules, and you said there was like some hyperparameter tuning, so is that, does that involve you manually changing the rules? Uh, no. So when I said hyperparameter tuning, it's uh, kind of the same kind of thing that you do for scikit-learn in the sense that you have a range of regularization, or uh, you like almost similar parameters because the similar classifiers are being used uh, in the background. So I didn't go much into it because um, yeah, it's uh, that, that's what I meant. Okay, but then do you ever change the rules yeah. manually? And yeah. is, do you think there's a, a, a way to automatically do that? Like include those as parameters of the model? So um, we are kind of working on that because, um, so we're kind of working on the general concept so you don't have to even write the rule code. You kind of encode the rules in some way and the code takes those rules and converts it into whatever the code needs it to be. Like you encode your general knowledge and then that gets encoded. Um, Right now, it's not in the form that you can change the rules as hyperparameters. Uh, the idea is that you do like one iteration, and you kind of see which are your worst rules from just a rule analysis. You also see um, like which uh, what like do you need a fresh set of candidates because your accuracy is lower in some kind of candidates, and then you go back and iterate. So maybe at the first go, label a hundred of the hundred annotations, write a bunch of rules, and my expectation is your results are not going to be better than 50%, just because if you don't know much about the domain, uh, my expectation is that it's not going to be very good. Then you examine the rules, but you probably even go back to the candidates and look at the words around the candidates, which kind of get encoded in the rules, uh, and you make the rules better. It's also possible that you need to make your candidate extractor better, so um, you kind of work on that part as well. Um, and through iteration, like through a few iteration, it's very easy to go to like 65 to 70 percent, even without being a domain expert, but just by looking through, looking at the data and going through this process. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, wondering if uh, this is looks like your examples were for candidate extraction. Wondering if this could be applied for overall text labeling, like spam classification, something like that? It could be. I've thought about it. This specific paper does not deal with it at all. Uh, but when I looked at this paper, that's the first thing I thought about, that this is not, this should not be restricted to text. If you have a bunch of rules, um, then you should be able to um, get, like you should be able to somehow get out of training data. The concept of active learning is around this space. And, um, so one, one of the things that the code does is it takes the rules, but it also puts the candidates on a factor graph, and it does a Gibbs sampling on top of it. So I'm not sure if that part is translatable to just about any data, just because uh, candidates and text have some property. But it should, you should be able to take a bunch of rules and model something for your data. And then if you look at this plot, Yeah, so if you're able to if you're able to get like the plus ones and the minus ones with your rules a good amount, and then in the center go to your zeros and label a hundred of your zeros, and then you should be in a good position to go to iterate over that and do away with training data. And a lot of the active learning projects are actually doing that. Nice. Yeah, Samantha. I actually have two questions because I thought of another one just now. So my first question, you said you were doing lemmatization in your initial description, yeah. but then it seemed like maybe you aren't doing that? Uh, so yes, uh, I am doing that. I don't do that myself. I like let the Stanford NLP parser do it. And I only do that myself when the text is either very, dis well, I mainly work with English, but um, when the text is extremely unstructured for the parser to ha handle or the parser gives garbage out, and that happens with uh, machine-generated text, 
or text with a lot of port numbers and the different like where numbers, letters are combined and it doesn't make sense. It also happens when people write other languages a lot and like you're writing a different language but you're still using English characters. Then it's hard for the parser to work on that. Well, I was specifically wondering because you were mentioning clinical terms. Um, in my experience, stemming those doesn't work the way it should. So I don't do stemming. Okay. I do lemmatization and what happens is for the, there are a lot of disease terms and drugs that don't have a root, and then you just get that term itself. And I, when I do the analysis, I have both the words and the lemmas. And depending, and they kind of get useful in the rules part, where I say I expect this word, I expect this kind of word in the words, and then I expect this kind of thing in the lemmas. So Actually, that was my next question, which was, how, is there a rule of thumb for how many rules you need for it to be useful? There is not a proper rule of thumb, but 20 would be a good number to start with. Having said that, typically I barely get 10 when I do the first run. It's just because I don't know enough about the data to write more than 10 rules. Uh, wondering, since you do have labeled data to begin with, uh, have you thought about creating the rules, learn the rules from the labeled data? And so I don't have labeled data to begin with, that's the assumption, but yes, that's something also that we are actually working on. Let's say you have some training data, can you feed it to a code and it just outputs the rules to you, and that's definitely possible. Like one very, very simple example would be, for instance, for the medical space, I kind of work like quite a long time in the pharma space, so I learned a lot of jar, I mean, I learned quite a bit about it. So I have this list of stop words that I know are not disease names, but are picked up very regularly. So I could take those stop words and just write a code that basically has, for, for the number of stop words, it has that many rules that these should not be there. And that's a very, very basic case, like you have to analyze the, if you have more, if you have better training data, you have to analyze it a little better to write the rules. But yeah, I mean, if you have, 100 tra training that data that's getting uh, tagged, uh, we're definitely thinking about how to automate that information to write the rules. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good job. Thank you.